answer and see. And if you still have questions, I will be happy to answer, okay? Thank you. Right. Welcome everyone to our third third lecture. Hi. So today again we will be talking about vibration. Free vibration without any damping effect. So this was as you remember uh, this is the simplest case that we can start our analysis on vibration. Uh, so, slowly, we are going to increase the complexity of our problems, but it will never become so complex that we will not have an answer for. Uh, I just want to make a couple... Uh, announcements before we start today's lecture. So this Friday, we are going to have our first tutorial session. And myself, I will be here as well for the first tutorial. And we will have six GTAs, six PhD students in different years of their studies from first year to fourth year PhD students. I will introduce them. I will introduce them to you guys. And also, I created a list or a group for our students for you. Because of the structure of the lecture theater, it is in general quite difficult. If you are sitting in the middle, for example, and if you have some questions, it is. Uh, a bit difficult to reach out to our GTAs in general. So what I am thinking for this year, uh, it will be great if we can stick to this protocol. For example, we have six groups in total. And say the first half of this left tier, if first half will be just group one and the upper part group two, here, for example, group three, four, five, six, or something like that. We need to create a structure. Therefore, you will be able to get in contact with our GTAs. I think it, it will a bit simplify the process. So if we can set this out on Friday, and if we will stick to this structure, the sitting plan kind of, uh, for the rest of the semester, I think it will be quite useful for everyone to get uh, answers easily. So I already uploaded the group list. Uh, it is just an uh, alphabetical list, guys. So I downloaded the list from Blackboard and just assigned you all in six different groups. And each group has a specific GTA assigned to them. So on Blackboard, you will be able to see the list. Please first check the list and then see which GTA is assigned to you. And I'm going to introduce them on Friday to you guys. So this, I think, again, I hope this will simplify the process. Because uh, in previous years, uh, I checked what our students told us. Because you, you are able to provide the feedback at the end of the lecture. And also during the semester as well, I am taking some feedback from my students. And one. Uh, one thing that they advised, uh, and they thought that it could be better, a structured way, as I explained, for the tutorial session. So let's see. And I hope that this structure will help us a bit uh, better probably this year. And also, I'm going to send another email about this. But in the first tutorial, we, are, we, we, we have four different questions. But we don't have enough time to work out each and every problem. So the tutorial questions now are available to you. The first tutorial questions are available on Blackboard. What I would like, please, you to check the questions, try to solve them, attempt at least, like, you know, uh, to try to work out and find out the solutions. But also, 
pick one of them. There is a survey available, the first item on the Blackboard content page. So the survey asks you which question you want us to work out during the tutorial session. Because of there are, I mean, we have four questions, we don't have enough time to work out all the problems. Instead, we are going to work out one problem in detail for the first half of the tutorial session probably, and the second half of the tutorial session will be an opportunity for you to uh, ask the questions that you have to our GTAs, okay? First half of the tutorial session, we are going to work out one problem, and then the rest, you will, it will be an opportunity for you to ask any questions you have about any questions of those tutorial session. Right, uh, I thought I would forget my all announcements and I took on out on a post-it paper and I forgot it in my office. So <laughs> I hope that uh, I remember everything and I told you about all announcements. Anyway, I'm going to send an email, a reminder again about this. So now we can continue our lecture today. So last time, we watched that video about the harmonic uh, vibrations or oscillations, and I, I was hoping that this uh, motion would help us to understand the motion of a mass attached to a spring and to a fine graph. So how they are related, I think this uh, animation helped us to understand the graph, the sine graph or cosine graph that we use when we are solving questions about vibrations. So, as you can see, so now you know actually how this uh, simple harmonic motion can be represented as a sine wave. And now we will try to understand a bit more characteristics, some characteristics about this graph. Last lecture, we showed you how we can represent this simple harmonic motion with a single uh, equation. There were different equations, as you can remember, uh, but I told you last time as well, the decision of which equation that you need to use, it, it, depend, is de it depends on the given parameters to you. So it really depends. So if you have, for example, the phase angle as we discussed last time, then this equation may be the, more, the most appropriate one, but other uh, A sine omega t plus B cos omega t equation, for example, also can be used, but it may need some extra manipulations of the equations. So. So this sine graph actually is the plot of this equation. And in the graph, you can see a couple of uh, characteristics that will be quite useful when you are trying to solve any problem. These are quite intuitive, uh, I believe. So one is, for example, the amplitude. Where is amplitude? The C, the amplitude, the maximum displacement of the motion. We call it amplitude, and here we show it with C, but C is just a parameter anyway, a constant, so it can be represented by another <coughs> parameters. And also, I think an important aspect uh, or characteristic of the graph that you need to be aware of is the phase angle. The phase angle, as you can see, is it just tell us where the mass is at the beginning of the motion. So if the mass would be at the in the position of equilibrium, x equal to zero, for example, your graph would start from O origin and it will go like this. But it tells us now, actually it is not in the zero equilibrium position, but a bit towards left. So this is where the mass starts motion according to this graph. It could be otherwise as well. So 
just know that the phase angle actually just represents the initial conditions, conditions of the mass, initial starting point kind of. And there are different manipulations again. So that is the C can be represented as A squared plus B squared. A and B are the coefficients of previous equations that we were using. So again, phase angle can be represented as the tangent of those constants. Another significant characteristic is, of course, the period. So the time it takes to complete one full cycle, we call it period. And since this is also representing a kind of circular motion, so the, the time taken to complete this full motion around this 2 pi radian arc kind of represents us the, or gives us the period. And also we know that this omega n is actually, what was it, omega n natural frequency of the system and we know this omega n is actually uh, square root of k over m so you can also write the tau equals 2 pi m over k squared, sorry, square root. Right, these are relatively simple things so I'm a bit uh, going fast at this point. Frequency again, the time of the cycles it takes uh, within a given time. So this is also a uh, reciprocal of the period. These are quite simple characteristics or parameters, but they are quite powerful and it is really important to understand them in the beginning of the semester or lecture, so it is quite important later on as well, you will see. I think one important aspect here we need to know about one hertz, the, the unit. For over the last maybe like you know, five years, again I, this is fifth year, over the five years I have been trying to uh, reinforce with my students about the importance of the units. Units are again very powerful, very important guys, so please try to use the correct, the right units all the time. This is one of the things, again, we need to reduce marks when we are marking uh, the exam papers. So please make sure that you are using units. I cannot really uh, overemphasize the importance of the units. And all the time, I give one example to my students. Have you heard about Gimli glider? Correct. Right, thank you. Correct. So it is about, again, uh, confusion about, I wouldn't say it, but uh, confusion about the units. So Due to the confusion of the units of the mass of the fuel that they had to take on the plane, they took half of what was required. Again, because of the confusion of the pounds and kilograms, as your friend explained. Thank you. Thank you for that. And luckily, the pilots were able to uh, land the plane by gliding action, kind of. Aerospace students will know more about this. So the planes can glide, and if they are lucky to find a somewhere to land, they can. So it was again, I mean, partly due to luck uh, of the people and the pilots, and also experience, also obviously of the pilots, they were able to land the plane uh, without any casualty or without getting anyone hurt. 
but it was just a coincidence. Here, my point is, although you can, you may think that, okay, I am a now second year engineering student, don't tell me about units, because I know them already. It's not about that. Sometimes if you are overconfident about yourself, you, you are prone to make some mistakes. The amount of fuel probably was checked by technicians and their superiors and pilots. Pilots have to check as well when they are before, before, before taking off uh, with the, during the controls. Two pilots also checked and they said, okay. So imagine uh, the consequences. It is not about in the dynamics unit you are making, according to you, you are making some simple mistakes and then it doesn't have any consequences because most of the time what I get from my students after they see that you know they, are, they lost marks about the units, they send me email how harsh I am, it is a simple unit mistake and how I can reduce that, that much mark. So please be prepared to this kind of things because again, units are important and they can make uh, serious consequence. They can have serious consequences in our lives. So again, I am warning one more time, guys. Units must be correct in your solutions. And this is why I was telling about hertz. Sometimes you will see it one cycle per second, and also because a cycle is actually a two pi around the circle here. You can also see, depending on the question, 2 pi radians per second as well. So this is quite an important thing here. So again, it's kind of uh, reminding or repeating some things for reinforcing your knowledge. So you know what is natural frequency now. So if you are uh, applying a force to a system without any uh, dampers, and if you are just leaving the mass from a uh, displaced position, the motion of that body of, or the mass is called, uh, or the frequency that that mass is moving, called natural frequency. And you know that we, with single degree of freedom systems that we are dealing with, you can call the motion simple harmonic motion. So what was it? Simple harmonic motion. The mass. Sorry. The displacement and acceleration are proportional to each other. Right, and this is our main equation that we will be using in our solutions. This is procedure for analysis, and I, I, or please read the procedures because again, um, whenever you are solving a problem, it is really useful to follow a specific procedure to avoid any uh, issues, any problems, and forget anything. So this is quite important, and it will give you a kind of discipline when you are solving some complex problems, and make sure that it will make sure that it will help you to avoid some important uh, errors, or make some errors. So, it is really important to check Blackboard pages of Dynamics Unit because I am uploading continuously every week. I upload something and the solution, a video recording of the word example one is already available. So please make sure that you are checking our videos and trying to understand or trying to uh, get, try to get prepared before the lectures in general. So here, there is one important thing that I want to emphasize, and I'm going to continue with the word example two. Remember, I told you in our first lecture, if you will have, if you will feel that actually you may need some extra help with some of our concepts, I would provide you some extra support for that. So. Again, from last year, a couple of my students approached me and they told me about their confusion about different coordinate systems. So they were not really sure about which coordinate system that they could use here or they need to use here. 
and then I tried to get some extra information from mechanics uh, topics, and I tried to, again, uh, refresh their memories here. Uh, so normal and tangential coordinates and when they when you need to use them or when you can use them to simplify the problems so please read these sections i'm not going to uh, details here again due to our time constraints but if you will have additional questions please don't hesitate to put them on uh, discussion board Again, these are from a mechanics unit, but some extra information for you guys. So, detailed solution of this problem is available on Blackboard. Again, as I said, is a recorded video. Just here, I want to ask you one thing. So, we work out the problem, and we find that the tau, which, what is tau? Period, right? So, the period of the Oscillation, 2 pi square root L over G. What does it mean? I mean, there is no mass, there is no M in the equation, right? So, does it mean that regardless of the mass of the bob, still we will get the same period if we have the same length. Because g is constant, we are assuming it is constant, pi is constant, so the period is only actually depending on L, the length. I'm not sure it is so intuitive, but imagine also the theta doesn't have any effect on the period. There is a mass here, you pull it, say, 20 degree, and leave it, so you get a period, I don't know, two seconds. You took it higher up, like 80 degrees, you leave it, and the period is still the same. I would expect the period should be a bit, maybe, I don't know, longer or shorter, actually, because it is higher when you leave it. It should complete the cycle maybe in a shorter time, but it is not. And also mass, if I have a one kilogram mass and leave it from 20 degree, it completes the cycle in a one second maybe. And if I have a hundred kilogram of mass here, still, if I leave it, if, if it has the same length, it will still complete the cycle in the same time. Not very intuitive, I think. Uh, it may not be the case for you. And also, please think about the pendulum clocks. Have you ever saw any pendulum clock? Like grandfather clocks, as they call or grandmother clocks. <laughs> right? So, is there anything this equation to do with those clocks? If you're, if you're designing the clock, for example, do you think this equation would be helpful in any case. Okay? Just think about this. These kind of things, reflections, it is really important to get the right equation here as a solution, but it is as important as that to think what that equation means, how it is related to engineering solutions in life, like, you know, what, what is the consequence of that? And the first man to realize this, maybe not realize, but uh, prove it in, in an using an equation. Who, who could be? You know the man, lived about 1600. Galileo, right? So Galileo was, according to the story uh, of from the Rao's book, you can see, last time I think I showed you the book, our one of the uh, good textbooks that we use. According to the writer of the book, Galileo was, again, I think it was, uh, in a, he was in a church, he got bored, and there were several lamps uh, 
in the church, and obviously it was a current probably, and the lamps were swinging, and the Galileo was trying to measure the period of the lamps using his pulse. Quite clever, I think. And there he realized actually it doesn't because the lamps were probably with, I mean had different masses they were you know different in shape as well maybe so he was quite surprised to find out that uh, the period of the oscillations or vibrations were independent of the mass of the lamps so then I think after that he thought okay I need to go and write down some equations to prove it. I am not sure it was the same form. It, maybe it was a bit more like complex in the form wise at the time, but after a bit more like you know, intensive workouts and simplifications, I think it makes quite sense. Right, again, equations, deriving them, very important, but if you don't know what they mean, Again, we are missing something. So please try to reflect on the equations that we use in general. Then the solution of the next one, worked example two. Uh, again, I will try to highlight the important points here. This is our <coughs> general equation for the pendulum. You will see how we drive it in the solution available on blackboard so we can easily calculate the omega n omega n means natural frequency which means you are holding the pendulum the bob to some height and when you leave it it is oscillating with this frequency omega n so it will take four point 95 radians per second, I mean the frequency. And the general solution, our general solution, normally we had x, but now our coordinate is defined by theta. So now our general equation becomes this one. And then from this equation, first obviously we need to find out the a and B. What, what were A and B, guys? Integration. Coefficients. Integration constants, coefficients, whatever. So in order to define, so this is our equation. This means that if we know A and B, it means that we will be able to know the angle of the pendulum at any given time. So, it is really important to find out those A and B's, the constants, and the way we find them, or we can find them using the initial boundary conditions. This is very important to read the problem, what was given, what is given to us. So, we will find it based on the given values. For example, they say, the question tells us, the velocity, 0 0.2 meters per second is given, initial velocity, and also we know the initial position, theta zero. So these are the given initial boundary conditions. We also know what is the length of the cord, and then they help us to find out A and B here. So we know that at the beginning of the time, when time is zero, our pendulum is at the position of theta zero. When you substitute these values into the general solution, you find out that actually B, <coughs> B is 0 0.3. So what does it mean by substitution? What you need to do, because we are talking about time is zero. So in this equation T, where you see T, you are substituting with zero, and you are substituting theta with 
theta zero. So when you do that, you find out that b equal to theta zero, and also theta zero is given to us in the question as 0 0.3. Therefore, you found the first or second, whatever, integration constant. Now, we only used one of our initial boundary conditions, which is theta equal to theta zero at the time, at the beginning of the time, when time is zero. Now, we have our second, uh, what? Boundary condition that we can use, but it includes velocity. So, what is theta, guys? Theta is our angle rotation angle, right? So somehow we, we got velocity, like linear velocity v given to us. So somehow we, we should be able to use that v and relate it to theta because we only know theta because our coordinate axis or coordinate is defined by theta. What you can do? say theta is the angle of rotation and can we get angular velocity somehow? Because this is angular position, theta. How you get the angular velocity? You take the first time derivative of the theta, then you will get the angular velocity, right? Theta dot. So this is what we need to do here. So we take, this is a bit going different uh, order, but when you take the time derivative of theta, you will see that you get this equation without the else anyway here. And now, in addition, you need to still relate the theta dot to given linear velocity v. How you will do that? Here again, the knowledge comes from the mechanics is very important. And since we're doing the, uh, from first year mechanics, I am kind of sure that you know this from the circular motion that actually velocity is omega times L. What is omega? Angular velocity, V, linear velocity, L is the radius of the motion, right? So this simple equation from mechanics gives us a very powerful tool to relate the given linear velocity to angular velocity. So this is again, if, if you don't know this, for example, it will be very difficult to move forward in the, in the solution. So this is why it is really important to check and refresh our knowledge, information, uh, background from mechanics uh, unit. Then we obviously equal to L times our angular velocity. We, are get, we get our second equation where we can use the second initial boundary condition because the V is given to us, right? What was it, 0 0.2 something? So we can just now substitute that. At time zero, we know that velocity equal to minus V. So by just substituting, we get the second constant. It means that we defined our equation completely. So just putting A and B in the equation, you are getting our Quite beautiful equation. And then, is it the solution? Yes. So now, for example, if the rest of the solution or question was asking you, what would be the angle theta after two seconds? What you would do? You would simply substitute T by two seconds and you would see where the pendulum would be after two seconds or whatever uh, given to you. 
Uh, here you can see question one. All solutions will be available to you guys, but maybe I told you earlier as well, the first thing I want you to attempt, I want you to try solving, I want you to get the solutions, I want you to see if you cannot get the solutions, I want you to struggle. I want you to try to find the solution yourself first, because this is the way we learn in general. Okay? But after our lectures, the solutions will be available anyway for you to check and reinforce your understanding. But please, I know that you know you are so busy probably. You, you take different lectures, doing projects maybe, and some social activities and everything. You may not have time for it, I understand. But still, you need to spare some time for studying dynamics units, right? So how many hours you need to, officially you need to spend? In total, including the lectures, for a 10 credit lecture, you need to spend 100 hours. So you are spending maybe, I don't know, 24 hours by lectures, tutorials, or 30 hours. The rest, you need to uh, invest in your own time as well. So please try to invest some time on understanding, on studying, and attempting problems. As I said, Please try to solve it, and the solution will be available on Blackboard. Now, uh, we will continue with our second subtopic. This time, remember, so far we, we were dealing with free vibrations. There were no external forces. The system was only under the influence of the gravitational force and there were no springs, there were no dampers. It was, there was no damping and also no external forces uh, applied to the system. So this was a simplistic case. Now we are going a bit uh, one step towards the complexity. So we are now uh, talking about again undamped system. There is no damper in the system, but we have uh, a forcing, a force applied to the system. Here you can see the relevant sections. So, trying to find, especially when you are using the online version of the book. How many of you guys check the textbook online? Blackboard, reading list online, no, not yet. Good. Great. So it is really good. I mean, myself, I prefer to have a physical copy, and it is easier for me. But sometimes I think uh, it may be also advantageous to use and check some online version of the books as well. And also, I think we have a limited amount, limited number of the books in libraries. So it may not be, it will not be enough for everyone, so this is why we have digital version. So please check, guys, the textbook. You will see it is quite useful. And I am giving you the section numbers in order to make sure that it is easier for you to find the relevant sections. So, as I said, we are now going to talk about the forces acting on the vibrating system or again undamped forced vibration systems and in general you can see here different forms of the forces applied to the systems it can be periodic non-periodic it can be i don't know square triangle sawtooth whatever like you know there are really like different or random shapes but Still, many of the mechanical parts or structures are under or working under harmonic, harmonically forced, harmonical forces. Or so this is why we will be talking about the systems under harmonic forces. There are two reasons for that. The first one. Again, there are really different types of machines under this type of loading. The second one, it is the easiest 
one to deal with in an introduction, introductory course, kind of. Okay? So these are the reasons why we are dealing with these courses now. Uh, and also, it is quite convenient to use a mass and a spring model. You will be immediately able to see what is different than topic 1.1, undamped free vibration. In previous case, we had mass and spring, but we didn't have any external force. So the only difference from the previous system is the addition of this harmonic external force. That's it. Again, step by step, we are going to uh, increase the complexity of the system. And at this step, we only add an external uh, force to the system, external harmonic force to the system. The rest of the analysis is the same. What we do, we are just writing down, we are first obviously taking our free body diagram, and different than the last one, again, we only have this external applied harmonic force. What we do, again, Newton's second law, right? That's it, as simple as it is. And the form is now, on the right hand side, you can see we have, it is not zero, but we have some uh, equations on the right hand side. What does it mean? It means that it is now a second order equation again, but it is non-harmonic. So I am going to refer to your, again, some mathematical knowledge, differential equations. So if you see any equation like that, like non-homogeneous second order equation, you know that there are two solutions available to to this system, and the solution is the sum of these two different solutions. So, one is complementary solution, the other one is called particular solution. Uh, again, we will be talking about this particular solution a bit in detail shortly. So, we will be able to see two different solutions. Complementary one, we call it XC, and the particular one, we call it XP. So the complementary solution, how we get it? Do you, do you remember at all uh, how, will, how were you dealing with these uh, non-harmonic differential equations? So the process is quite simple, guys. The first thing, in order to get the complementary solution, you just set the right side of the equation equal to zero. You assume that the right side is equal to zero, so when you do that, when you assume that the right-hand side is equal to zero, it just actually turns out to be the same equation that you obtained in previous lectures, right? So it means that actually XC, the complementary solution, is the one that we already got in our previous lectures, okay? The complementary solution is the one we already obtained, which is, again, XC, C sine, whatever, Again, different forms that we can use for this uh, x. And omega n is all the time the same, k over m, right? Which was natural frequency of the system. And now we need to think about the particular solution. What is that particular solution? Since our equation, the forcing, the, or the force, the applied force is, force is harmonic, we can assume that the mass will be also making an, a harmonic motion. So therefore, we can assume that the XP, the particular solution, is in the form of X, capital X, sine omega zero T, where the capital X shows us the amplitude of the system. Uh, if I would be working again on this slide myself later on, I would think, okay, the lecturer didn't tell us about this, but I think this would confuse me a bit. What I'm telling here, as the motion is periodic, the particular solution can be determined by assuming a solution of the form of this form. How? Why? This is a critical question here. 
And the reason why we can assume that, I just want you to see what does this force means. Imagine now our mass is in the equilibrium position and then you are applying a harmonic force which is F0 sine omega 0 t, which means that the amplitude of the force, the maximum amount of the force is F0, and then there is something called like omega 0 t, which is forcing frequency of the system, which means that you are basically the force applying to the mass periodically. So our F0 or F is pulling the mass to the right, by omega zero t and then returning back to the other side, right and left, right and left, okay? So this is the force that you apply. So if you are applying a force like that, then what would you expect this mass to react, how it would react? Again, the mass and it is position x, xp, the particular solution, right? Xp would follow this force forth and back. So this is why, since we are applying a kind of uh, harmonic force to the system, then you can expect the displacement of the system, the XP, follow this form. I think, it may be confusing guys, I agree. I think just one thing, later I will use this as well. Imagine now, you are, have you ever uh, pushed someone on a swing? Right, okay. Let's go back. Now, think, this is the person that you are pushing. And you are applying a force with F, F0 sine omega t. Okay, so when you push, the displacement should follow the sense of your pushing force. So if you push it from here, you expect the mass to go forward and come back. And then you push again, right? So since you are applying a periodic force, you expect a similar period or, sorry, a similar harmonic motion of the mass as well. And now, just one thing I want to ask you before I continue. What do you do if you want to stop the person? I mean, think about this, okay? It is quite clear, I think, but think about this and try to uh, relate what now I am trying to tell. Probably you would try to continue pushing or when it comes to you, you push. Exactly. In the exactly. Thank you. About timing. Timing is quite important as well, but I think this made the sense. Thank you. So this is what we assume, and if we assume this form of solution, and if we make some extra manipulations to our equations, we find out what is this x. X is the amplitude of the displacement when you apply this harmonic force to the system. So, by substituting this X into our equation again here, we got this great simplified formula, and with the purple background, it means that you will get this in the formula sheet. Great. So, as I said, there are two different uh, solutions, XC, the complementary solution plus XP, the, the particular solution. So this is our general solution for this type of forced and undamped vibrations. So the first one, this complementary solution or displacement would disappear by time because of the frictional forces in the system. But the second one will be all the time on the system. So this is why we call it in general steady state solution as well. So one thing guys, this is quite common. As I said, 
this complementary part will be will disappear due to the frictions in the system. Do you can you give me any example how or in a in a case where this complementary solution disappears or the complementary displacement obviously it is. Uh, again I will give you one example. Probably some of you have driving license. When you start a car or when you're starting the car, you will feel the vibration level is a bit high when you are just trying to attempt to start the car, but it will get smoother after some time, right? So it means that the complementary part is going down. And the rest of vibration is the steady state vibration. A similar one with your washing machine probably, when it tries to get the spin rate, it is giving you a bit like headache, right, sometimes, depending on the model, right? So after a while, it disappears somehow. How it disappears, again, the complementary part dies out, and the rest is just steady state one, okay? So these are quite important parts. Just two minutes, guys. I know that, you know, uh, I am over time, but just two minutes, I want to come to a part here. So you can see this particular solution is depending on the frequency ratios, omega zero over omega n. This is a very important thing. Magnification factor, in the definition of magnification factor, we use it. Magnification factor defined as the steady state amplitude over the static deflection of the force applied. So this is a very important parameter and I think it was a, an exam question last year. So it is quite an important parameter, guys. Please try to know this. And we will continue with the graph in our next lecture. Thank you very much for joining today. And thank you very much. Thank you very much.